Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Mas Sheikh from Stars Play, uh, father of two, uh, a friend, I can say a personal friend as well, uh, and a mentor. So for me, it's, a, it's an honor to have you on uh, the show Talks with Tea. Thank you, Tarek. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't think I, uh, I mentioned this before, but you're only the second guest. So you've also elected yourself to be a guinea pig of sorts <laughs> on, the, on the show. So I d- double appreciate that. <laughs> no, not a problem. Um, I, I think the story that we're going to go through today is going to be a very interesting one because it's, it's one that I appreciate and we're going to go kind of jump around back and forth. Um, and, and I thought we could just start with this crazy idea that you had um, when you were at the top of your game uh, in the corporate space at uh, at OSN, uh, and how you had the kahunas to uh, <laughs> to say, you know what, I could be the next CEO here, but I'm gonna jump ship and uh, start the streaming business. My journey is is perhaps not uh, uh, very standard uh, to most entrepreneurial journeys where. You have a grand idea or a grand vision. Um, it was actually um, me and my colleague uh, at OSN. And during lunchtime, we talk about 10 different ideas each day of what we wanted to do. And then we had this process where um, we'd come up with ideas and then we ourselves shoot them down. Right. And, and then it's very motivating. <laughs> it's very, very <laughs> motivating. And we shoot it down saying, OK, why wouldn't it survive? Yeah. And um, and at the end, I, I remember after tens of ideas, we zeroed in on two ideas, and and neither one of them we ended up doing. But one was, um, a, uh, you know, setting up sort of a credit rating system in in the region. Now this is eight nine years ago, yeah. and then the other one was uh, sort of an insurance uh, marketplace, which obviously a lot of companies got started in that space and and uh, and are doing well. And so so yeah, so we we were looking at ideas. In every which, uh, in every different space, and then at the end we zeroed in on what we knew. We felt, look, we don't know much about the insurance space or the credit, you know, rating system. Uh, uh, let alone, you know, getting into uh, this new financial uh, industry. So we stuck with media because that's that's both that's where Danny and I, uh, you know, my colleague, yeah, uh, who's now my co-founder, uh, we knew we knew media. So. Um, and then uh, in, within media, our, our initial idea was slightly different. Um, it was more of a hardware uh, idea to build to build a box that would integrate all types of services. But then when we were in the market uh, raising capital, looking for investors, we uh, the appetite to invest in a technology hardware company in the MENA region, just, you know, especially eight, nine years ago, it just wasn't there. But then we saw um, appetite for um, a direct-to-consumer streaming business. And everyone said, well, that's where the valuations are. That's where the money is. And so, so we tweaked our idea to go into that direction. So it wasn't something that we came up with originally and yeah. just stuck with it all our lives. Yeah. And so it was, we, 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 were, we were more sort of after the, uh, the, what we were trying to do was build something not necessarily a specific idea, but something we believed in. And and what I guess what was the what was the impetus there? What, you you were doing well at OSN yeah. uh, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes. You didn't necessarily need to go out and do something on your own or leave. No, um, look, uh, as they say, you know, um, the, the life was good there. Alhamdulillah, yeah, was very good. Yeah. Uh, very good salary, uh, benefits, bonus. Um, but I also got to a point where, um, you know, I was in my mid forties and I felt, uh, it's now or never type of a thing. And, uh, I also had a little bit of a personal ambition where I felt, um, there was a bit of a a burden of generations in my family of, um, of, uh, perhaps, um, uh, entrepreneurial, ventures or journeys with mixed results you know um so my dad tried it my dad was a chemical engineer and working the corporate world and then twice in his life he tried to do something on uh, on his own uh couldn't build it my brother who's also a chemical engineer he tried to do something early on as soon as he graduated from university couldn't build it 
and and just stayed with the corporate world. And same with my grandfather. Mm. It was only my great grandfather that actually uh, had had a business of his own. So I had this little ambition, if you will. Uh, that I felt that there was a burden of generations here. That was one. Uh, second one was I'd been at OSN for a long time and um, had a, held a C-level position for several years and uh, was passed for a CEO job, you know, a couple of times. And then I was like, okay, I'm not going to get a CEO job here. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to build my own company. So I would say there were those two things for me. Yeah. One was personal ambition. The other just circumstances at work. Mm. Uh, there's this perception that, especially in the tech space, that um, businesses are started by younger generation people yeah. uh, who have nothing to lose per se, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you took the leap of faith in your in your forties. Um, and so, for people listening, what piece of advice do you have, or or how do you kind of looking back at it, how do you think about your own psychology at that moment in time? Because, you know, you have kids, schools, yeah. you know, it's not like, a, it's not like you have nothing to lose in that, in that stage of life. Perhaps, you know, let me start with the, the, the advice mm -hmm. I'd give. So I think, um, generally speaking, I definitely advise to start that entrepreneurial journey as, as soon as you can in your life. The <laughs> earlier, not, the better. It's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah. the, the earlier, the better. The, I mean, well, this is the advice I give. Yeah. I give, um, I give my kids. Yeah. And, um, but in my case, uh, it was slightly different in the sense that I had done, uh, even though I started my career as an engineer working for Sprint in, in US, which was a big company even back then, but I did leave that job at Sprint to work for startups. They weren't my companies, but I worked as a product manager. I worked as an engineer in, in technology startups in Silicon Valley. So, so I had this, um, if you will, desire to do that again. Mm. And um, so, but, but fast forward to, you know, um, f uh, when I'm 45 years of age, yes, like you said, you know, the responsibilities are much higher school fees, college mm. bills, mortgage payments and mm. whatnot. So, yeah. so, th so the commitments are definitely higher. And that's why you, um, it's a lot more stressful. You know, it's, it's a lot more stressful because you, you are walking away from something. Your, your um, opportunity cost is very high. Yeah. And um, so, but, but also I think there's trade-offs. Um, you have a lot more gray hair. You know, you have a lot more experience. And so especially if you're going to start a business that that's going to require, um, that's going to be capital intensive, mm -hmm. that's where I think it, it helps to have that years of experience and know the industry, know the space, so that investors are backing not just uh, one person's brilliant idea, but they're sort of backing the depth and experience of, of a wider team. Because that's the other thing that happens is as you as you gain more experience in an industry, you can pull a team together. Mm, mm. And that's, that's what we were able to do. Uh, we, we were able to bring people together who, who were working at OSN um, in, in, in the Middle East, but also people that came from um, HBO in the Nordic market. So mm. we could bring those expertise and bring those people in. So there's trade-offs uh, uh, in summary, you know, as, as you gain more experience, as you get older, you build some contacts, you get gray hair, you get experience, but then yes, it, it is uh, your opportunity cost is, and there's a lot more at stake versus when you're 25 years old. And what's kind of going through your mind <coughs> in that, in, in those moments where you're saying, you know, the, the opportunity cost is, is quite uh, massive. And so how, you know, how do you find the will or how do you find the courage to kind of push yourself over over the finish line because you know I, I did a similar jump I was with GE for eight years and I was I was 29 though right, right. and when I when I took the leap of faith and uh, no family nothing and uh, e at that point in my career it was very difficult because I, I like you said you know the the golden handcuffs were yeah. you know were quite uh, attractive um, and so I can recall that it was a very, it took me almost a year to make that decision. Um, and, and you were single? 
and I was single. So yeah. that's why I'm saying I can feel yeah. it's even more intense at, at that stage. So, you know, w- w- were there specific things in your life or were there specific uh, experiences that got you ready for that moment to just push through the the fear? So the fear was very high. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those uh, people that I can be, you know, I... My personality is such that I have a tendency to operate on extremes, you know, so I can be very relaxed at times and other times I'm very, very stressed about, about some things. But so it doesn't seem to show on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, You're like a Zen master on the outside. <laughs> well, uh, the, some people will disagree. Okay. But <laughs> All right, fair. <laughs> um, no, but I, yeah, I, I, do try to, I, I do try to manage it. Yeah. But I would say that it, 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 that journey was perhaps the most uh, stressful uh, journey of, of my life. Um, I had, uh, t- 2014 is when we were building yeah. this company together. And, you know, uh, so in the same year, I, I quit my job, uh, started this company, uh, moved homes because we could, we could no longer afford the home we were living in, moved homes and uh, sold my cars. Um, and, uh, and while at the height of it, uh, we were raising capital, uh, right before we closed our series A, unfortunately, my, my father passed away and, and he was 83 years of, uh, age. He, he lived a very good life, but still when you lose a parent, uh, yeah. so sorry it, it, to hear that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so, you know, uh, for me, all of that combined 2014 was, the most difficult uh, year of my life. And um, how did I get through it? Uh, I would say perhaps uh, just one day at a time. You know, I, I, I never, and even today, I don't try to solve uh, for long term too much. You know, you, you, you have to have some high level thinking and high level plans. But I very much uh, break things down into what's important today, what's important in the next three or four days. And then I tend to let everything else go. And uh, so, yeah, so for me, it was day to day, uh, managing one day at a time and uh, one little step, one little milestone at a time. And uh, yeah, so for example, at that time, you know, we started with, okay, we just have to, all we have to do is close our seed round. And then once you have the seed round, all we have to do is build our prototype and get a Series A round, right? And then gradu- and once we had Series A, it was like, it was all about, we're going to launch the service in three or four months and there's nothing else that matters, right? So, so that's basically the mindset, uh, mindset you needed is, is just to break things down into smaller uh, steps. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. I think the hyper focus is super critical. And uh, in in startups or when you're building a company, there's just so much noise. Like yeah. it, there's, you know, we always say that there's a hundred fires, but there's one or two fires that are important to put out. Everything yeah. else is not going to burn the building down. And then those things start to materialize and then you need to focus on those. So, yeah. so I, it makes a lot of sense. I, I love the approach because it helps the hyper prioritization. Yeah. I mean, look at, at that time, I, I definitely didn't think of it that way. And, and I, I, uh, I didn't know there was a thing called hyper focus, but now, now <laughs> I know, <laughs> but, and I also like your analogy yeah. of the, uh, the house burning down. I think for me, it was, um, I'm naturally a type of a person who can't, multitask uh so and that so helps th- that helps yeah. you know naturally yeah. i can just only do one or two yeah. things and i and so so um whereas my my co-founder he's he's a little more uh, uh structured that way he can handle mm. you know um you know so if you made me a project manager i'd be the worst project manager in the world you know or you'd be really good at one project you <laughs> yeah. know i'd be good at one task <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah, so for me it was uh, it came naturally yeah. to me, and and the other thing I would say is you you have to, um, I, I think you you need a deeper purpose, you know you mm-hmm. need a deeper purpose, a deeper mission, and for some people it's changed the world. Some for some people it's you know uh, I want to give back to the community, um, and it could be as simple as I want to do it for my parents. You mm-hmm. know, like when I talk to you and yeah. and your brothers, yeah. 
you know, you talk a lot about your parents, yeah. right? And and to me, every time we we have that conversation, to me, it feels like part of the reason you're doing all of this is is to you know uh, make your father proud of yourselves and yeah. ma- ma- you know um, ma- make that mark uh, for your family. Mm. And so, whatever that inner purpose is, mm. whatever that deeper purpose is, you need to find that. And and for me, like I said, it was sort of that generations of uh, uh, mixed results. And then I would look at my kids and 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 say, you know, uh, what am I teaching them? You know, what legacy? Not in terms of a company or a business, but uh, you know, what learnings are they getting? uh by seeing me go through this phase and so they see me go through a very very vulnerable phase in life where i was weak personal you know with my father losing my father and everything and and they would hear me always on the phone you you when you're going through this journey you're essentially pitching yourself and begging for money all the yeah. time right yeah. and so they heard me go through this phase and i think all of these things add up uh, to um to giving your kids a bigger, you know, sort of deeper education. And and for me, um, that was perhaps the, the deeper purpose that I'm doing it for the family. Mm. But you have to find that deeper purpose inside you because the journey is so difficult. If you're doing it for the money alone, of course, money is a factor for everyone because mm. money means stability, money means independence. So money is always a factor, but there's got to be more. And uh, and because the journey is difficult, and if you don't have that deep inner purpose, then it's uh, then it's difficult to survive. Yeah, get through it. Yeah, yeah. I always say it's um, the entrepreneurial journey is uh, you know it's like a one day you wake up, you feel like you're the king of the world, and then the same afternoon you feel like you're a peasant, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the volatility, yeah. like you said, you need something to to keep you keep you going. You, you almost need to, um, you know, if you think of it in terms of waves yeah. and amplitude, so you almost need to take out the peaks and the troughs and manage your life to, to an so average. Just, yeah, 100%, 100%. In my view, you're one of the OGs in the, in the tech industry. And one thing that people may not be familiar with is that you were one of the first startups to raise such a massive Series A round. And... I think at the time you had a prototype, but it was it yeah. wasn't a live paid subscription service yeah. yet, right? And yeah. I'd love to kind of learn a little bit more about that experience. So I think that's where uh, having those years of experience uh, was helpful. That that doesn't mean that uh, the younger entrepreneurs get discouraged with that, but it's just that um, in our case we we had an experienced team. Uh, so I think that was perhaps. A huge factor in in um, in building that confidence with the investors. Um, but leaving that one aside, um, like you said, Tarek, I mean, going back, uh, you know, 2014, the, the 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 VC culture and the tech culture in this part of the world was was getting started. You had, uh, you know, Ronaldo at Souk, you know, building his venture. You had um, Mudassar doing Kareem. Uh, and and there was Fetcher uh, back then, so there yeah. were a few startups that were uh, that were raising capital and and building a business, and uh, we it, it was difficult to raise capital at that time. Um, but what we realized uh, early on is that the the amount of capital we're looking for is such that uh, we're not quite a fit for a VC because, mm. like you said, we hadn't launched the service yet, yeah. right? So. Um, and 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 so it was too early for a VC to p- to back us with that kind of capital, you know, because uh, we were looking for thirty to forty million US in our Series A. But at the same time, this is the kind of capital you would expect from a PE firm. But we weren't quite ready for a PE firm because we didn't even have a business yet, mm. you know, let alone being a, a profitable business, yeah. which is what uh, most PE firms love to do. So we weren't quite a fit for either one. So um, the, the path we took was slightly different. We uh, looked for investors in the industry. So we looked for strategic uh, investors uh, with the idea that um, they know the industry, they know our space. Um, we would, you know, our pitch to them was that 
um, we would go to the studios and say, look, sooner or later, the, the world is going to change and you guys will launch your own direct-to-consumer service. And, you know, eight years ago, this was hard to imagine. But now, obviously, as you know, this is, this is the trend. This is this the norm, yeah. This is the norm. But eight years ago, they weren't quite ready to ex um, accept that because over 100 years, their model had been creating content and then selling it to platforms. And the platforms used to be cable companies, then satellite companies, now Netflix. Um, but we were able to convince uh, one of them to say uh, with this idea that, look, you can do this, call it an experiment, call it a trial balloon, try it in uh, Middle East, where today you have very little revenue, so there's no cannibalization risk for you. Um, and, and in doing so, you'll also be building a technology platform that you can use in other parts of the world, even if it doesn't, even if the direct-to-consumer business doesn't work out. Plus, the icing on the cake is we would launch your brand in, in these markets in the Arab world where you don't exist today. And so we, we, we were able to get that with, uh, with STARS, which is, which is a, um, one of the key studios in, in U.S. And, and then later they merged with Lionsgate, so it's STARS Lionsgate now. And, and so we got a strategic um, investor uh, from the industry, a big name from the industry, to validate our vision. Uh, validate what we were trying to do uh, and that's very important so if you can get someone in in, in the industry to uh, to back you early on it, it makes a, a lot of difference in the long run mm -hmm. um, but the balancing act Tarek was they also said that look uh, while we're going to back this we're not a financial investor uh, so we're not going to foot the entire bill so now you need to find a financial investor to um, invest alongside dollar for dollar what we are investing in this venture. And that's where, but having lo having locked stars as an investor, you know. Now it makes it easier to go out it there. It made a lot easier, yeah. 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 It made a lot easier to speak to PE firms. And so one of the firms that that uh, that backed us is, uh, is uh, General Electric's pension trust, mm. uh, General Electric, uh, GE's asset manager, mm. your former yeah, employer. Yeah. Uh, there as, so your, your pension trust is invested yeah. in us. <laughs> I, feel, I feel comfortable with that. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, obviously the, the, the fund is it's billions massive, and billions yeah, of dollars. Yeah, so yeah. That most of the investments are, are conservative, yeah, yeah, but then yeah. they have a very small carve out. Yeah. Uh, for high growth uh, companies like ours, and and we were part of that small fund, and so so that's how our, our journey got started. So it was Stars and and GE Pension Trust that came. And, and did you go in with this idea that we're gonna have to uh, find find an investor who has industry experience, or was it through trial and error that you finally came to this conclusion? No, it was definitely trial and error. Um, we we knocked on so many doors. Um, in 2014, I, I became Emirates Platinum flying economy in, in six months. So, <laughs> so you can do yeah, the math. Yeah, that's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of miles. Yeah, for um, sure. A lot of back pain. <laughs> a lot of back pain. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've gone back and looked at my calendar one time and and, and so we must have met, Tarek, over 100 investors in, in a span of six months um, and, and all over the world. Uh, I think the only continent we didn't go to was, was Australia uh, and Latin America. But everywhere else, uh, you know, J Japan, Singapore, U.S., uh, Europe, um, uh, North America, I mean, everywhere, uh, Canada, <laughs> we went everywhere looking for money, um, whoever would take a meeting, and because um, those days, Zoom wasn't a thing, yeah. so you had to do you meetings to in person, yeah. and and I'm glad, I'm glad Zoom wasn't a thing back then, because there's no way I we would have been able to raise capital uh, over a video conference call, because you have to shake hands, you have to look people yeah. in the eye. And so, yeah, so I flew a lot, uh, knocked on a lot of doors and, and just, uh, you know, went where people were interested. Did you have a list of contacts that you were able to knock the door or you, you literally it was just a sales process, build a pipeline, look at who could be interested in space, cold call, outreach? 
Yeah, all of the above, yeah. uh, right? So um, uh, having having been in the industry uh, here in MENA region over the years, my, my former CEO uh, from OSN, he, he was very uh, gracious, he's well-connected, so he, he definitely made a few introductions. Uh, th- and one of those ended up becoming an investor. And then secondly, I'd... Um, over the years, gotten to know uh, the studios, having worked in the industry. So when we decided to talk to strategics, it was easier because I, I knew a lot of the studios and knew a lot of the management there. So those were warm contacts. But but at the same time, we, we would do this where you make a trip to London, land and start, you know, calling people yeah. down the list, uh, cold calls as well. Um, so yeah, it was it was a combination of contacts, cold calls, uh, LinkedIn messaging. LinkedIn is quite effective, mm. so I highly recommend uh, LinkedIn as yeah. a, as a tool for this. I, I think um, a lot of people don't approach fundraising like a sales process. Yeah. Like you know, y- you build the funnel, the outreach. You know, you have kind of stages of the funnel. Yeah, you're putting people through. Um, you know, sometimes I'll talk to entrepreneurs who say, oh, I can't find any money. I've talked to like 30 VCs. They're not interested. And it's, you need to take 100 meetings. Yeah. So it's like you're talking to 500 VCs at that yeah. stage uh, to get there. No, you definitely need to manage it as a funnel. You know, you, you have to build the top of the funnel. Uh, and then, like you said, you break it down exactly like a sales process. You know, how many, you know, phone conversations have you had? How many face-to-face meetings have you had? How many follow-up meetings have you had? Maybe you started at an analyst level, then uh, they are going to take you to the partner, right? So so you, you definitely have to see, yeah, you might have had 100 meetings, but did you meet the decision makers? Uh, and then a lot of times it's all about timing as well, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when especially in 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 Mina region at that time, there were two or three big firms, and I, and and because I had been in the region, I was able to talk to the the senior team. So talking to the decision maker wasn't a problem, but the feedback was always, "Maz, we've recently lost a lot of money in the media industry," and I would say, "Well, that's print." Yeah. No, I'm doing something <laughs> different. Yeah. That's that's proof <laughs> that you need to be doing what I'm suggesting. But uh, but exactly. But, you know, so that, I use that as an example on timing, right? Sometimes they've, they've had a bad experience in that industry or that sector. Um, and so, so that's why they're not investing in it. So, so you really have to manage it uh, as a sales process. Uh, and a lot of things have to come together uh, for, for, it to be, for, for you to find a successful investor. And that comes through volume. You know, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's certainly... An element of luck and chance, but it's also a numbers game. It's also a numbers game. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing I found is that you may end up meeting with an investor who, like you said, the timing is not great. Um, but as you progress on your journey, um, you know, uh, uh, one of you know a, a very gracious investor of ours gave us a really good piece of advice. He said that when you're raising funding, it's like it's not like an arranged marriage. You know, it's like a love marriage. So. You have to, you know, start the flirtation process very early. You have to get to know <laughs> them, put on your best suit before yeah. you guys get in bed together. And yeah. so those early meetings, even though they may not materialize into someone investing at that stage, yeah. staying in touch with those investors as your journey progresses could turn, could make the next fundraising round significantly easier. Yeah, and uh, absolutely. And I think... As much as we all learn from past experiences, uh, you know, we need, when you're going through this journey, keep your past experiences in the back of your mind, but also leave your preconceived notions to the side uh, and not, uh, and and approach every meeting, uh, every interaction with 100% enthusiasm. And, and, uh, I've I've been in meetings, uh, Tarek, where we were meeting PE firms in London, and and you'd walk into their office, and it, there's so much money you could see, you know, yeah, just you the, just the art hanging in yeah. the in the lobby, right? You're like, if you're not giving me money, I'm gonna take this painting and I'll <laughs> exactly. sell it. <laughs> I mean, just the art hanging yeah. in the lobby yeah. is worth more than you know the investment you're looking for, yeah. right? 
um, and 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 we'd spend weeks on you know literally, you know, parked outside their office in a hotel, whatever they need, we get it ready for them, and and nothing materializes. You know, you you meet seed investors who, you know, are driving Rolls Royces, S Class Mercedes, the Rolex watch, the expensive shoes, the expensive suit, everything. And after six coffees, you you're like, okay, I didn't even get ten thousand dollars out of this guy, um, and and that's fine. You yeah. you go through this journey, and for example, after all these meetings, uh, the, I went to GE's office and uh, met these two gentlemen. You know, no no Rolex watches, you know, no Ferragamo shoes. Yeah. They're wearing simple khakis. Yeah. And uh, the American way, <laughs> the American, <laughs> th- their Casio watches, yeah. and just a plain T-shirt. Yeah. And we start, uh, we start talking, and uh, you know, I'm doing my sales thing, trying to qualify how much money they, they have, you know, because the office looks so simple. <laughs> 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 and and the, you know, they're very humbly, they're like, yeah, we we manage under twenty eight billion dollars, right? And and I'm just sitting there, I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> nice. Um, but they ended up investing in us, right? Yeah. And and uh, and so so one has to park your preconceived uh, notions of um, who's your typical investor. Because you never know. It could be the yeah. person with the suit or it could be with the person with the khakis yeah. and the t-shirt. Yeah. Sometimes when people are on the outside looking uh, looking at an entrepreneur or a company, it, they only see the, the positive PR uh, yeah. and not the hustle that goes behind the scene. Yeah. Uh, and I know the first few years, as you were trying to build a subscriber base, it was... It wasn't a straight line. Um, I, I know that on its own was was really a journey. And yeah. um, I guess when you when you take a step back and look retrospectively, what's your biggest learning in terms of the first five years? You know, I read somewhere that it took you five years to get to two million subscribers, and then it took you six weeks to get to six and a half million mm-hmm. subscribers. So those that first five years that that you know hustle, you know. What were some of the key learnings for you in terms of managing your own psychology through some of the the downs and even kind of just managing your team around you, right? Yep. On on continuing to push. Tariq, I, ne- I need to correct those numbers. Okay, <laughs> they're right. not that good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, but but I think what you were uh, the essence of what you were saying is correct. Yeah. Uh, so we have a total of two million subscribers yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but during six weeks of COVID in terms of consumption and how much people yeah. were watching our content, yeah. we grew more in six weeks than we did in six years okay. before that. Okay. So that, that part is true. Okay. Um, but the, 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 the five-year journey, um, I think the, uh, for me, perhaps the most important lesson was um, no deal is, is, uh, is, is too small. Um, you, you have to respect uh, every individual subscriber or every b2b deal that you can you can get your hands on and you build your business gradually um i'll uh, i'll share I'll, sh- I'll share a little story here from about 25 years ago i was i had i had uh i had the pleasure of working with um at a tech company in in in, uh, in denver colorado and this was a vpn vpn security company and on our chairman was at that time was constantly on the Forbes list, uh, on the Forbes cover of the Forbes magazine uh, as the venture capitalist with the Midas touch, created billions of dollars of wealth in, in his lifetime, uh, even back then. And he's still around and he still does major investments. His name is Pramod Huck. And, uh, and he, he's like in Silicon Valley, he's like a celebrity. Everyone knows him. Big name. And so we uh, once I was in in a, in a board meeting presenting the pipeline to him, and and uh, I'm going down the list. Every deal I have, everything from ten thousand dollars to you know probably a million dollar. You know those that that was yeah. my entire pipeline. And then I had this habit of saying when I got to towards the end of the smaller deals, just skipping through them, you know, and not talking about it. And he would get upset. He goes, "Mahaz, doesn't matter. Yes, this is the board." But I want to listen to what's going on with that $10,000 deal. And oftentimes I would say, well, promote the challenge is um, these guys are worried that we might not be around as a company because we're a startup. They're going to put all their technology in our hands. 
And then we, you know, we're not around because we didn't get the funding. So he goes, stability and, and funding is the issue. I said, yeah, okay. He goes, let's go meet the, the, the CIO. And, and sometimes I would not be able to get a CIO to meet us. And, and he'd be like, let's go meet the IT manager. So here's, here's perhaps the biggest name in Silicon Valley. And he's sitting on the board of, you know, tens of portfolio companies. But he takes the time to get on a plane with his VP of sales from one of those companies and go meet IT managers all around the world, yeah. uh, helping build companies. And, and to me, that was a very valuable lesson, and that's what it takes. And we, you know, fast forward 20 years, that's what we had to do when we were doing our B2B deals. Um, one of our first uh, partnership deals was with Etisalat in UAE. So, you know, when you're building a small tech company, and your first B two B deal is with at this a lot. Yeah, it doesn't get any bigger. <laughs> it than doesn't that. get any bigger <laughs> than that, right? So, and so uh, there was a lot of waiting in the lobbies, meeting the right people. Sometimes spending two or three days just around the office in their office, yeah. just to make sure you get to meet everyone. And you have to be patient. And and no person is too senior, and no person is 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 not big enough, right? So everyone, uh, you need to cover all all levels. Um, but to me, that's perhaps the most uh, valuable experience. You know, even if it's a small deal, don't don't think of it at that way because it can become strategic in the long run. Yeah. I I see that even translate into your, the way you are personally. Like I think one of the one of the things that I respect a lot about you is no matter who's in the room, you treat it could be anybody. You treat everyone the same. I've seen that when we're out having a bite or you treat everyone the same is that something that you learned growing up or is it something that you kind of developed with time uh no i th i think look uh, growing up definitely um my my father's always been a uh, big influence in my life i remember um i was maybe nine or ten years old and my 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 father was in between jobs and looking, you know, he he'd, uh, he he was unemployed at that time, so he was looking for a job at that time. And um, and he we once went, so him and I, he took me to a train station uh, because he had to because there was no one else home. So I he took he I went with him, and this was in Pakistan. So you know, uh, in in that part of the world. When the train comes to the train stop, it only stops for like two or three minutes, and it's chaos. You know, it's like thousands of <laughs> getting people, on, getting, getting off. yeah, and it's thousands of people. Yeah. And I remember it was a, it was a mess, and you can't, you don't know where people are sitting. So he was going, he was trying to meet a uh, potential, you know, uh, employer, his potential boss, in one of those uh, train, uh, uh, you know, uh, train bogies, if you will. Yeah. And so we were going in that three minute. We went from you know one one, one uh, train bogey to another, looking yeah. for looking for this guy, yeah. and uh, and and finally we met him. And he was he was very rude to my dad, you know, because uh, yeah. we we spent half an hour, forty five minutes waiting before the train, and and it was very stressful to find him, um, and and that that really hurt my feeling to see my dad. You know, being like that, be, being treated disrespectfully, yeah. or he didn't even give him a proper time, yeah. and and so uh, that's what that definitely left a mark on my on me in the sense that uh, you know everyone has a story. There's there's uh, uh, hundreds of lives attached to every person we meet. Everyone is trying to make a living. Everyone is trying to provide a better life for for their kids. My dad was there not for himself. He was there just because he wanted to provide a, uh, a living for his, uh, for his family. So, you know, I, I try to see every interaction beyond just uh, a superficial uh, hi or a hello, because there's definitely a lot more to that person every time you shake their hands or like we were talking to Vok about. And it helps me make connections as yeah. well, right? Yeah. The moment he said Serbia, I'm like, okay, it's not Serbia, it's Croatia, but my, my son's best friend is from Croatia, yeah. right? Yeah. And I've been to... so. It also helps with that human connection. You know, now I'm never going to forget his name because yeah. I've, I've established that connection. Yeah. So I think part of it is personality, but a lot of it probably growing up that way around yeah. my dad. Yeah. And it's amazing because, you know, I was never a, a big believer of this when I was younger, but uh, I really believe the energy you put out is kind of the energy you get back. And if you yeah. just treat people with this kind of 
you know, concept of everyone has a story yeah. that just feed that builds on itself. And, you know, um, the, sm you know, the smallest interactions sometimes have the biggest impact down the line and life just ends up working out in a way where, you know, we don't actually know what's coming, coming later. Um, yeah. and, and those little moments sometimes come back and pay dividends, even though that wasn't the intention. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if, if it's karma or, or, uh, or anything of that sort, but I think it's just more importantly, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, making it meaningful. Make, I mean, for example, you know, when driving around uh, in, a, in Dubai, you know, you can get frustrated with, because there's drivers here from all over, all over the world yeah. and everyone drives in their own way and sometimes sitting in a car you can get frustrated but i try to remind myself everyone is in dubai to you know improve their lives you know they've left a home behind and made dubai their home why because of a better life they're trying to provide uh, you know uh, uh, a, a better life for themselves and their family so let's just all get along on the road but it's little things like this i think you just gotta think beyond the, the superficial frustrations or interactions the business is adapting and, and evolving and uh, um, for you personally how has you how have you as a leader or as an entrepreneur developed and evolved you know the Maz of 2014 2015 versus you know the Maz of 2022 you know how have you evolved well, that's a tough one um I'm not sure I have evolved, <laughs> but, uh, but I would say tweaks, tweaks, <laughs> tweaks. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure it's getting better. The evolution, <laughs> maybe, maybe, there's no maybe. devolution. It's just evolution. Maybe, maybe Mars of 2022 <laughs> is worse than the Mars of 2014. Who knows? <laughs> Depends who you I, ve I very highly doubt it. <laughs> um, look, I think, um, um, for me, perhaps the biggest thing has been, um, realizing where I'm good at and where I'm not um, and when when I'm not good at something I can I can be destructive forget value creation I can destroy value yeah. I can distract people I can I can jump from one thing to another um, I can confuse people mislead misguide so one of the things I've learned to do better over the last six or seven years having gone through this journey is is realize that my role as a CEO is very different. Uh, my role as a CEO now of a company with 150 employees and and you know two million subscribers is very different from my role as a startup uh, CEO seven years ago, because at that time, one or two projects that I was obsessed with, going back to the hyper focus, yeah. uh, could could create a company. Yeah. And it did, you know, we signed early uh, B2B deals, like I was saying, we signed up a partnership with Ethis a lot that gave the employees, that gave our investors uh, the confidence. And I would say that that first partnership with Ethis a lot in 2015 was uh, what my former bosses would call a company maker. Yeah. And that created a company. But now we're at a stage where there's, uh, you know, hundreds of things that need to be done simultaneously and and I'm not good at that uh, so what what I'm trying to do now or what I focus on now is still finding that one or two things that I'm good at and 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 focusing on those but leaving the execution and the complexity and the project management of lots of little things that are going on with uh, with with the team and I still like to you know, be on the road and 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 meet people and so so I still get involved in in sales and business development, but uh, not on operations because that's that hasn't been my strength. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting realization during the the life of a company where you where you realize that the total sum of the man hours or human hours worked from your team is going to far exceed what your human hours and so. Yeah. It's just like about getting out of their way because they're going to do much more than than you can do on your own. Um, and that evolution is is an is a w when you have the aha moment is a yeah is a game changer. 
And, you know, I'm also, by personality, I'm one of those people that, uh, in lots of aspects, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. But at the same time, I can't, uh, I can't create perf- uh, perfection myself. So if you asked me to create a PowerPoint or a business yeah. case, and you said, Tariq said, Maz, make it perfect, I can't do it. But if someone made it uh, for me, I'll find 10 reasons why it's not, <laughs> <laughs> why it's not perfect. But uh, so it, that's good if you're the CEO and you're the yeah. boss, yeah. but you can't abuse that privilege, right? Yeah. So, so I've learned uh, not to abuse that uh, privilege or that responsibility. And I think the second thing um, for me has also been, um, you know, I feel quite, whatever becomes of this company, and I hope we create a lot of value for years to come. Um, but for me, one of the biggest, uh, perhaps, privileges has been working with my uh, colleagues and with my board members who've accepted me as their CEO mm. for eight years. Mm. Uh, and, and, and to me, whether you call it survival, whether you call it, uh, they, gave me this, they, gave, they gave me this trust and privilege, that's been uh, very rewarding for me. Mm. And so, so now when I find myself critical of something that someone else has done, you know, I, I try to step back and, uh, and, and reflect on that, that uh, being a CEO or being a leader is not a God-given right, mm. you know. Mm. You, you have to earn it uh, every day, uh, number one, and people have to give it to you. Because you can, you can be a CEO for the namesake. Yeah. They don't believe in you. They don't trust in you. Um, and when you walk the hallways, uh, you know, they don't even make eye contact with you because they, they just don't believe in you. And I, I never want to be that type of a CEO. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that, uh, you know, I, that I still feel the burden. Um, and so, so that, uh, I think that has changed a lot in the l- last seven or eight years because mm-hmm. in the beginning I, I felt like an individual contributor who had to close this deal or that deal and bring money to the company because I felt that was creating value and that made a difference. And that was back then, but now it's different. We're going to go on a bit of a tangent and this is a, a, a personal, uh, something I've been thinking about since I've known you. How long have you been jacked for? Like how long have you just <laughs> been ripped, you know, <laughs> biceps the size of my head? How long has that, has that been in your life? Oh, that's 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 very old. Uh, I would say now uh, I'm trying to do the math. So I've been doing that since you know I was 14. Oh, really? I was 14 years old. H- so. How did you How did you get into weightlifting? So, um, so my my grandfather uh, was uh, was an amateur boxer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I remember he was he was 75 years old, and this is in our home city in Multan. He he actually studied in in UK. And he had these news clippings of uh, of uh, how he he played uh, for Great Britain. Um, he, he he played not for Great Britain, but he played for his university while he was in Great Britain. And um, and uh, so he he was he inspired me a lot back then. He was seventy five, and he could do like still do thirty forty push ups a day. <laughs> and. Uh, and so we, um, so I think that's where perhaps the inspiration started, and and uh, my dad got me a pull up bar when I was fourteen, and and then I you remember back then when you know you create your own barbells by putting you know cement in cement, yeah, <laughs> yeah, cement yeah, yeah. and cooking oil <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> boxes yeah. and, and putting it together. So I had one of those setups, and yeah, it just went from there. Um, but then when I moved to US, you had a I had access to a proper gym, and I just went crazy. Um, for me, I, I think working out is when I was going through going through those difficult times. Yeah. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I wouldn't sleep for two or three nights, mm. and I wouldn't sleep for you know a couple of days. And and I still remember, even if I haven't slept all night, I'd be looking at the watch, seeing okay, what time is this gym going to open so I can go work out because yeah. that would be the thing I look forward to is is going to the gym even if I haven't worked out all uh, even if I haven't slept all night I've seen you at uh, I've seen you at the <laughs> gym you know you just go in with such a level of intensity um 
and you know that discipline is something that that I respect a lot is is kind of the discipline you have to to come in show up and just kill it yeah I mean I, I think for me um, it's it's become very natural over the years you yeah. know when you've been doing something for 35 years uh, you know that whole notion of uh, 10,000 hours yeah so I did the math I'm well above 10,000 <laughs> hours of working out because uh, if you you know because I I don't I don't skip uh, you know I've had a few surgeries and I, I can't wait to get back and so for me it's it's no longer um, making an effort to yeah. show up uh, it's it's become very natural but I think you know going back to what does it mean for you know uh, our colleagues or people who are listening it's it's really that you you have to have uh, a passion in life it could be reading books it could be yoga it could be listening to music uh, I, I never had sort of the attention span to to actually you know start and finish a book properly and uh, and never had the patience to listen to to uh, to music calmly, so it's it's just one of those things that I gravitated towards was was working out, and and now I find it extremely uh, extremely therapeutic. It's it's sort of one, you know, hour and a half every day that that's part of my life. That's just for me. Yeah. And nothing and nothing else. You know, no one else. Nothing else is just me. Yeah. And and I and 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 the other thing I think, you know, I've realized over the years. I'm I'm one of those people who you know who are sore losers you know don't like to lose yeah. so I I used to play a lot of squash growing up and uh, quite competitive but then I would hate losing in squash the good thing with lifting weights same thing with running you know you're not losing to anyone <laughs> <laughs> you're just and <laughs> everybody's a winner <laughs> everybody's a winner yeah. and you work out and you're only you know maybe one day you don't have a great workout. Yeah. But that's it, you yeah. know. Uh, you don't lose to anyone, and the other thing is you don't have to schedule anything with anyone. You don't, you know, yeah. you don't have to. I mean, I look at people who are schedule, uh, you know, who are planning for golf. I don't know if you go. Yeah, but no, I don't. Well, well, yeah, neither do I. Yeah. And and the amount of time and effort that goes Just into wasting. planning, yeah, yeah. Planning. And I'm like, I could have built a company in this time. <laughs> <and effort. laughs> so I like Jim because of that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And there's something, um, something super soothing and peaceful in the morning when like you said where it's just it's like you know when i've tried when i've tried to work out in the evening it's um, not the same it's not the same as the no. morning right no. and that that like you said the hour where you know um you're just alone yeah uh and then there's also i feel like there's a little bit of cockiness in it because i'm like you know it's 7 30 in the morning i've already gone to work out and, yeah, yeah. and people are just getting out of bed to kind of start <laughs> yeah. their day so it just makes me feel good yeah i, f I feel the same way yeah. i think uh getting you know I in the morning is the best time to do it your energy levels are high and and it, it also helps you clear your m i know it's a cliche mm. but during workout even though i'm saying i'm not thinking about anything else there's still thoughts that are going through your mind and and to me in the back of my mind there is some planning because i'm a horrible project manager as we were discussing yeah. and so i'm still trying to narrow you know in the morning i'm trying to narrow things down to what are the one or two things if there's a big especially if i have a big meeting mm. that day if let's say there's an investor pitch that's coming up i'm going to be thinking about that investor pitch all night the night before and during my workout and uh, until until that meeting so you're not going to see me with cue cards, but I'm I'm prepping in my mind while working out. I think we could spend you know another two <laughs> hours talking. I didn't get an opportunity to uh, talk to you about you know what the experience was like uh, moving from Islamabad in Pakistan to to the U.S. Uh, to start your university. Well, maybe that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> our conversations you know a couple of things you know i heard you say were you know have have a purpose um uh, respect every opportunity in life and uh, and in interactions and in the funnel because uh, everybody has a story um and those are things that you know i'm going to take away from this discussion <laughs> It's 
it's been a pleasure uh, to be able to do this in front of microphones <laughs> for some reason instead of doing it over over lunch or dinner like we usually do and honestly i mean like i said you're a, for me you're a mentor uh, you're a great person and it's been uh, an honor uh, having you as the second guinea pig on the on the <laughs> podcast so thanks for taking the time thank you so much Tariq. it was a pleasure uh, being part of this i enjoyed the conversation and and i look forward to more of your podcast.